Welcome to Data Streams Dive into Data webinar series. Today, our topic is going to be QAQC for water quality data. My name is Mary Crook, and I'm a water data specialist at the Gordon Foundation. And I'm joined by Megan Thompson, who is a limnologist and one of our senior science advisors with the, with the data stream team. Um, we're both based in Calgary, Alberta, which is a traditional Treaty 7 territory and home of Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Um, just a few housekeeping issues with, or housekeeping uh, items before we get started. If you have uh, any technical issues during the presentation, you can put some comments in the chat, but some of my data stream colleagues are here um, monitoring the chat and they can help you with that. Uh, if you have any questions, um, technical questions about the presentation material, you can enter it in the Q&A window. So you should see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And then either Megan or I will answer your questions during the presentation, or if, um, if it's a longer question, we will likely wait till the end and then uh, cover off all the Q&A at the end there. So uh, with that, I will get started. So just a um, quick intro about the Gordon Foundation. It's a 55-year-old charitable organization based in Toronto, Ontario. The Gordon Foundation has a long history of protecting Canada's watersheds and working with northern communities in Canada. Uh, DataStream is led nationally by the Gordon Foundation in collaboration with other regional partners. And DataStream is an open access hub for anyone who wants to share or access water quality data. So just an overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, Megan's going to start off the presentation by defining some common terms associated with QAQC. She's going to define the difference between quality assurance and quality control, um, and then run through what steps and protocols are involved with uh, QAQC processes. And then I'll jump back in and I will review some tips for data inspection, whether that's reviewing your own data for any errors or bias, or whether that's reviewing someone else's data set before you use it. And we're going to be covering a lot of information in this webinar um, and tailoring the information to a wide range of groups. So the information will remain fairly general. However, what, what one of the goals of this presentation is, is to try to highlight how DataStream can help you through this quality control process. And with that, I will pass it off to Megan. Thanks, Mary. Uh, yeah, uh, like Mary said, my name is Megan Thompson. I'm glad everyone can join us today. So I'm starting off uh, pretty general here, talking about precision and accuracy in water quality data um, and thinking about a water quality monitoring program. So um, this is just a, um, this is actually a really common um, image or sort of schematic that comes up when you start talking about precision and accuracy. So I've taken this one um, just off the internet and uh, what it's showing here are different scenarios of what you're measuring and what you're trying to measure. So each of the four circles um, is an attempt to measure something that uh, red X is the true value of what you're trying to measure. And the blue X's are your observations. So in this case, your water quality samples or um, readings that you take in the field. And so there's a, an idea about uh, something called precision and accuracy, and they're defined here. So pre precision here, it says it's a scatter of a set of observations and accuracy is more whether or not you're in the right, whether you're actually measuring the value that you are trying to measure. So the examples here then are in the upper left, um, you know, scattered uh, all over the place kind of randomly, your observations are not very close to your um, intended true value um, and they are kind of in all directions. The opposite then is the lower right where all of, uh, yeah, thanks Mary, she's trying to coordinate with me here, uh, where all of your measurements are actually really tightly uh, focused around your true value and they're located over your true value. So to the left of that there on the bottom, you can see that they're precise. They're very close to one another, uh, but they're nowhere near or not, not near the value you're trying to measure. And then the uh, upper right is um, where they're around the value, but they're not clustered. And so you're hoping to get both accurate and precise observations of what you're actually trying to measure when you're monitoring or sampling for water quality. 
And if you are not precise and accurate, next slide there, Mary, you end up with error in your water quality data and in your monitoring program generally. So error is not good, um, but also is to a certain extent unavoidable. Um, there are different causes, and this is a way of thinking of some of these causes that you can have um, uh, causes of error that are related to your sampling design, your monitoring program design, so that your samples maybe are not actually representative of the system that you're trying to measure. You can also have systematic errors that have to do with your instrument not being properly calibrated, it's not reading properly, um, you're using the wrong measurement technique, you haven't collected enough information while you're out in the field even. Uh, and then there's also errors that are more random. These are the ones that are very hard to remove. And so this can include things like unexpected things happening in the environment where you're trying to measure something that you were unaware of, but you ended up measuring it even though you didn't want to. And I'll get into that a little bit later. And then also things like personal bias. So this isn't like a personal <laughs> deficiency or anything like that. It's just that, you know, if you are mostly exposed to a system, let's say an open water season, or you're mostly worried about something, a problem that you think is an issue in an open water season, you may, for example, not focus enough on the winter season, even though it probably, it, it's, it may be important for you to measure during winter or a certain location that you're interested in without thinking about how representative it is or something like that. And so the solutions are on the right hand side of this slide, some potential solutions. <clears throat> and so the sampling design can definitely be sort of properly completed and you can especially focus on defining your background or your base case or just sort of understanding the, the current conditions in the area that you're in. Systematic errors, everyone is probably familiar with this, make sure your, your, your equipment is maintained and calibrated, uh, follow standard procedures, take copious field notes um, because it's, it's always um, handy to be able to go back and check them. And then those random errors are, you can, you can attempt to reduce them. Uh, you know, increasing your replication, um, trying to be as uh, objective as possible in your design and sampling. But it's very hard, as I said, to reduce those random errors. So a lot of the effort that is put into reducing errors is more on the sampling design and systematic um, uh, part of these errors. Um, and that's mainly what we're going to talk about. So next slide, Mary. So these are just pictures that I pulled off the internet, obviously, about how things can go wrong. But I think it's important to note, just to get a real idea of things that can happen in the field, because you really do have to be quite aware of these things when you're out sampling, uh, uh, either for an ongoing monitoring program or to in a research or a specific like targeted study where you're trying to answer a question. I put the cow in here just because it's like a personal, <laughs> personal issue with me working in Alberta. I have, you know, been trying to measure impacts of um, municipal wastewater effluent on rivers, for example, and then realized that there were cows in the river upstream of me um, doing their business while I was trying to take a water sample. So this is like one of those random, potentially unknowable er um, error sources in your water quality data. Um, there's also things like in the top picture here, an effluent that you're unaware of or a release that you're unaware of. Um, even a river or a tributary coming into another river. Uh, any of these things happening in lakes or rivers are things that, you know, you can't always be completely aware of, but you do your best to, to get a handle on. Then there is a picture here of, of someone doing some filtering in the field. And next slide, Mary. The filtering, the sample handling in the field, the, the um, filtering the field here, the left hand picture here, the equipment used in a lab, the equipment used in the field. Um, there is a potential for contamination of samples to occur during any one of these things. Any one of these things that you do uh, in your water quality sampling, you and the lab that you use or the lab that you run. And so using standard procedures, making sure that you're using the right procedures uh, and being consistent with all of your sampling and all of your calibration efforts is really important to make sure that you're not introducing these errors. And so next slide, Mary. So what is QAQC? These are the ways that we're going to try to reduce these errors, these systematic and sampling errors, a little bit of the bias and the, and the random errors. 
quality assurance is can you can kind of think of it as a way of preventing error. So taking um, precautions, following standard protocols, establishing standard protocols if you don't have those yet, making sure that your sensors are calibrated, talking to your lab, making sure that they um, are following standard procedures and that they have their own procedures in place. Uh, and even things like study design, the idea is to make sure that as much as possible, you're measuring what you think and what you're trying to measure. Whereas quality control is a little bit of a, a follow-up to the sampling and the quality assurance process where you're, you're taking these extra samples, you're doing these extra things in order to check that you have reduced the error as much as possible. So is the data you're looking at reporting what you intended it to do? So we'll get into that a bit more. Next slide, Mary. First, we talk about quality assurance. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a sampling program design, but um, you know you can take an entire course on sampling program design if you want to, and we could definitely do an entire webinar on it as well. Uh, that's not really the focus of this um, webinar, but I'll just point out a few things. One is that the role of the sampling program, like where you actually put your sites, when you actually sample, you really need to make sure that um, the, your understanding of the system is, is, is the reality of the system as much as possible. So if you're thinking about an impacted site or a control site, so an area that you consider to be clean and an area you consider to have some kind of an impact, you, you really should verify as much as possible that, that those areas really are clean control sites and impact sites and that there isn't some other impact that you're unaware of in those control sites. Uh, also, you can have one impact like uh, like I had when I was out sampling with the cows. Um, so I know that there is, you know, I'm in a, on a river close to a, a wastewater treatment um, or a wastewater effluent location, but there's also these cows um, <laughs> that I was unaware of. Uh, and so look for these other impacts in your impacted areas that can explain some of what you see in your data. And then to think about how what you're measuring might change over time with seasons and over the years, um, then does your sampling program uh, assess all that variability? Does it need to? Uh, in order to get out what you're trying to measure. And so this is the important considerations that you have to put into a sampling program in order to ensure that you're measuring what you're trying to measure and you're reducing those errors. Um, next, Mary. So into a little bit more detail about quality assurance, um, standard procedures are pretty important um, and they can be implemented in the field and in the lab. This uh, slide is about the field. So again, very similar to what I said before, you're making sure that your field equipment is calibrated and maintained. You're using the appropriate sample bottles for, that the lab has provided for you. You're, you're not allowing them to become contaminated before you go out for your samples. Um, there are standard operating procedures available from organizations like the CCME, from government organizations and other organizations as well. And including here, there's a, a little slide here on the bottom. This is low level mercury sampling. Um, this is an ALS slide, that's a lab. Um, but basically there's a clean hands, dirty hands technique with low level mercury sampling. It can be very difficult to get uh, those samples without um, having them be contaminated, even by things like vehicle exhaust or something like that. So following these standard procedures is a good way to ensure that you're not introducing any sy systematic errors into your field sampling. And the final one, my most favorite part of field sampling, these are the prettiest notes I've ever, field notes I've ever seen. So I took this off the internet as well. <laughs> this is, is to take good field notes. Uh, so, you know, certainly it has occurred that e even things like weather, if, if you see cows in the river, or if you see something unusual, or you notice something unusual, even something that you may not even know is unusual at the time, but you make sure that you create, you are noting down all of the conditions um, in the lake that you're trying to sample in the river. Like, is it low flow? What's going on? You know, these things can all help you because you're not really sure how things might end up going wrong in your data. But if you have a good record of, of, of what happened in the field, it can certainly help you to figure out why uh, things went wrong if they do. And the next slide, Mary. And then um, from on the lab end, so if you're submitting your um, samples to a lab, 
um, most commercial labs, a lot of them are certified under a system uh, called CALA, which is, uh, I believe, a Canadian association, uh, lab accreditation association. But basically, it's a it's a scheme by which labs are um, sort of tested. They have to report into the system to ensure that they are um, capable of producing consistent reproducible results uh, within their lab once they receive these samples. And they would be following things like standard methods um, that are put out by organizations uh, like there's a picture here of the uh, um, American Public Health Association and multiple others, US EPA issues and puts out multiple standard methods. Uh, the federal government of Canada has some as well. Those are VMV codes um, that are used to identify specific methods. And so ensuring that you know which method is used uh, to analyze your sample is important when you want to um, try to look at why, for example, one method of, of analyzing a parameter might actually produce different results from another method. And that there's nothing wrong with that. There's not an error, but they are different. And you may have some issues in terms of combining data sets. And so Mary, the next um, little pop up here is a pull out just a little clip of um, a data set that's in data stream and uh, just to show you that you for each characteristic or each parameter that you analyze a uh, data stream allows you to store the method information the standard method information including whether it's in this case it's an environment canada standard uh, method with the method id as a number so all that information can be stored in data stream when you're uploading data and you can look at it when you're uh, you know retrieving data from data stream as well and mary next slide so that was quality assurance uh, and a little bit about how data stream handles it now we get into quality control so this is the follow-up uh, to ensure that um, you are uh, your data once you receive it doesn't uh, isn't indicating any errors as well so there's an idea here to introduce um, for people who aren't familiar with it, but also just a bit of a review. Again, this is a bit of a schematic of um, uh, the idea of measurement limits. So um, in the field and in the lab, um, generally speaking, uh, we can't measure zero accurately. So if we are trying to figure out the concentration of a constituent in water, we cannot reliably usually measure precisely zero and say, yes, we are 100% sure there is none of whatever you're measuring for in this water. There is a bit of an area very close to zero where um, we, we can't say that for sure. But then usually relatively low concentration, you have something that is like a method detection limit. So that's moving from the left to the right in the schematic. And, and there's a detection limit here too. And it's, it's the ability to detect a constituent in the water. So you might not even be able to quantify it. You might be able to at this point, but you might even just be able to detect it. Uh, then potentially a little further to the right, you might have something that is the quantification limit, which means that here you can reliably say how much of that thing is in the water. Uh, and then even a little bit further to the right is something that is called a reporting limits. And so sometimes certain labs, depending on the performance of the method and, and, the, and the specific method they're talking about, will only report um, a concentration if it's above a certain value as well. And that each of those can be different, but sometimes they can overlap and be the same. The idea is though that, um, and the, the thing I wanted to stress here is that you may end up with data, especially coming back from a lab saying that this is below the detection limit or one of these quantification limits. And that doesn't mean that there's nothing of that thing in the water. It means that there's probably a very low amount of that thing and it may be zero, but it's somewhere between a low amount and zero. And that's as much as we can say uh, in terms of being sure of what's, what's in that water. So having introduced that then, when you look through a data set that's either yours or someone else's, it's important to note that, you know, some of the observations might be below these measurement limits and then to know what exactly that means. It doesn't mean zero. It just means too low to be sure. Uh, next slide, Mary. So here is a bit of an explanation here. Uh, it's, it represents a range of unknown concentration, I think is a really good way of putting it. Uh, and, and like I said, it doesn't mean zero. 
um, but it does mean that it's probably quite low. And so in the title of the slide, you can see in a data set, you might see something that says like less than detection limit, less than method detection limit, something like that. Um, those are, that's basically means that it's below these quantification limits. Um, the important thing or an interesting thing about quantification limits is that they can change over time, even in the same lab. So you may end up having like a high quantification limit for several years. Over time, they tend to get lower as labs get better and better at measuring things. But when you're looking at a data set over time, you may see that those quantifications are quantification limits are going up or down. And you should not confuse that with a, with, a, with a difference in the actual value of that parameter, just in a difference of the capacity of the lab to measure those things. So when you're trying to compare, like I say, one data set with another, differences in measurement limits can, can cause a bit of a problem depending on how high or low they are. So next slide, Mary. Uh, another quality control, um, tool is to use blanks. And so blanks, generally speaking, are water samples that are um, very clean, usually supplied by a lab. So there's special ways of cleaning water so that they contain almost no um, measurable amounts of a, of a given contaminant or um, nutrient or whatever you're interested in measuring. Uh, and then you treat, you, you analyze those blanks alongside your samples. Uh, and what you're hoping to find is that when you analyze those blanks, you detect none of those target um, constituents in the water. And depending on, on how you use those blanks, it tells you if you, do if you do find those or you do measure those constituents in the water, you can tell you where you might have actually had some potential contamination. So there's a few examples here. These are ones, these are data that you can enter in data stream. You can enter a field blank and put in um, the result, the analytical result for that field blank and attach that with your um, data set. The field blank follows, comes out with you in the field, in a lab bottle. You, you, you expose it, you open it when you would have filled it with water. You don't fill it with sample water, but you basically treat it exactly the same as you would with a regular sample bottle, except that it's got this clean water in it. Then you analyze it, and if you see some contamination there, you know that somewhere along that route it was contaminated. Then you can use other blanks, like an equipment rinse ink blank before you use your sampling equipment. Um, a trip blank, which doesn't get opened and just follows in the travel, and a lab blank, which is just in the lab in order to better refine where that contamination might have occurred. And so all of this data can be included in a data set and data stream. Next slide, Mary. So replicates um, are uh, another way <clears throat> to do some quality control investigations in your data set. And that is to take multiple measurements. Um, you can use that, you can use replicates for various reasons. They can be used in an actual monitoring program uh, in order to analyze your data, but they can also be used in this case as quality control samples. And so you can take more than one uh, measurement or observation when you're in the field, more than one sample uh, and have them analyzed or look at those numbers and make sure that at the same time and the same place, if you're measuring um, the same parameter, you're getting roughly the same value. Uh, you can also verify using a different sensor in the field, for example, you might use a thermometer to make sure that your, you know, uh, your sonde or your sensor is measuring accurately, and that's a bit more of a, a calibration. Um, and the labs can also split uh, a sample and run them uh, at the same time to make sure that there's no issues with the lab analysis. But basically, you're looking for some a similar result from the same measurement taken at the same time and place. And I believe that's the last aspect of quality control that we have. And I'm gonna hand it over to Mary. Awesome. Okay, thanks, Megan. Yeah, so now that we've uh, defined a bit of the terminology and processes that are used in quality assurance and quality control procedures, I'm gonna go through some tips that you can use when you want to perform some quality control either on your own data set, um, whether you are preparing your data set for analysis or you're preparing it to upload to data stream to share with others, 
or whether you are pulling someone else's data set um, and you want to use it as part of your own study. Um, these are some tips that you can use to look at your data set and assess if there's any errors or bias or anything going on in the data set. Okay, so the number one thing that you want to do before you use any data set is is plot the data. It's very important to visualize your data before you go ahead and use it and um, draw any conclusions from the data set. So plotting the data, even in just a simple scatter plot, or, which I'll cover in the next few slides or other types of plots, um, it can be certainly underrated at times because just by plotting your data, you can actually tell a lot of information. And it, it helps you quantify the variation um, at different scales. So you can quantify variation between monitoring locations. You can quantify the variation that occurs over um, a number of years, or um, depending on how often or how much data you have, you can also look at variation within a month, within seasons, between winter and summer. Um, even if you if you have a data set that's been collected at a high enough frequency, such as like an hourly frequency, you can look at differences in the time of day, which um, is referred to as diurnal var variation. And being able to understand all this um, variability is what is going to um, help you in determining what is an outlier and what is unusual in your data set. So, um, yeah, so DataStream offers a lot of um, plotting and visualization tools right inside the platform, which we'll show you shortly. Um, and it's an easy way to be able to quickly look at your data without um, having to play around with, with too many other programs. So uh, the first type of plot we'll go over is a scatter plot. And this is the default plot on DataStream when you open up the visualization tool. Scatterplot is um, essentially a two-dimensional plot illustrating a relationship between two variables. So when a variable is plotted over time, so when time is on the x-axis, it's referred to as a time series plot often. Um, and this is uh, on the screen here is uh, a sample of data collected at, on the St. John's River on the East Coast. Um, this is a community-based monitoring program that collected hourly temperature data. And by using a time series plot here, you're able to compare between different monitoring locations and the temperature profiles at each of them. So just by looking at this plot, you can start to answer questions like, does the relationship with time um, between these multiple stations look the same or is it different? Does one station have greater spread than the other in its temperature values? Does one station have generally larger temperature values than the other? Is it increasing or decreasing over time? Um, and, and this one, since it's collected hourly, you can actually look at the variation that occurs in temperature over the period of a day. So between daytime and nighttime. Um, and this is, yeah, this is like a very helpful visualization when you're beginning to look for any issues or outliers in your data. Here's another example of a scatter plot or time series graph on data stream. Um, this is more temperature data collected by the New Brunswick provincial government. So this is plotting temperature data collected over several years. And um, although you can, like the first thing that you might notice is that you see a similar pattern in the temperature data. However, rather than looking at that on a daily scale, this is looking at it over a period of a few years. So just by looking at this scatter plot here, you can tell several things. You can start to see seasonal variation. So you can see how the temperatures are higher, obviously in the midsummer than they are in the, in the fall or early winter. Um, you can tell temporal variation. So you can see that some of the temperature data in 2009 is overall lower than it was in the previous year. You can see uh, spatial variation. So between the different sites, how they compare if one site is generally um, have higher temperature than the other. And you can also notice data gaps. So in this um, data set, you can see that they didn't collect data over the winter months. And so all of these not, uh, observations about the natural variability of the data set are valuable when you're assessing your data and determining if there's anything unusual or out of place. So another really great tool, a visualization tool, is a box plot. So a box plot is, an, is a great way to look at the spread of a large data set and to summarize a large data set on one single plot. Um, box plots are defined by a few different 
um, statistical terms, which we'll define here. So if you're looking at the actual box of a box plot, how it's divided is um, the divider here in the middle is representing the median value. And the median is the middle value within a data set, which is different than the mean. So the mean is an average, meaning that it will be um, pulled up or pulled down. It'll be affected by any extreme values in your data set, whether if you have some extreme highs or extreme low values in your data set, the mean will be affected. However, the median is not. So it's a true representation of the central value in your data set. It can also be referred to as the 50th percentile. And a percentile is indicating a value at which um, that much, that percentage of your data falls below that value. So for a 50th percentile, it means that 50% of your data falls below that value. The 75th percentile means that 75% of your data falls below that value. So the box is defined by the 75th and 25th percentile. Um, and then these uh, whiskers or fences on either end of the box, um, those are defining the, um, the highs and like the max and mins within your data set. So these can be calculated different ways depending on what um, software or what method you're using to make a box plot. In data stream, the upper fence is defining the 95th percentile and the lower fence or whisker is defining the fifth percentile. Um, and anything that falls outside this fifth to 95th percentile range is going to be plotted as a single point, which is um, an outlier in your data set. So that is either the true max or true min in a data set because you can have uh, outliers that fall below as well. So a box plot, just to summarize, like it, it's really handy, like using all these parameters are great ways to assess your data because not only can you take a quick look at what the center of your data looks like, um, you can also look at the, the variation and spread in the central tendency or the, the central values in your data set by looking at the box height, that'll give you a general sense of the spread in the data. You can also tell how skewed your data is, whether your median value is either closer to the top or the bottom of the box will tell you a bit more about whether that data or that concentration or those values are generally more on the high end or generally more on the low end. And then you can easily identify outlier values. You can also plot multiple box plots on one graph um, and then compare between groups. Um, so this is a great way to summarize large data sets on one page. So here on data stream, you can plot multiple monitoring locations as box plots on one graph. So you can see the how the, um, the spread and the central tendency, these variables within your data set look compared to one another at different sites. Um, and yeah, that's, that's just like a really handy way to get a quick look and also highlight where your outliers are and what your outliers in one monitoring station look like compared to another. So yeah, we've been mentioning the term outlier quite a bit. Um, so it, it deserves a bit more of an explanation. So what does it actually mean when there's outliers in your data? Um, it can mean several things because um, Outliers in your data set, especially when you're looking at water quality data in a river or lake, um, it can indicate that there was a rare event that occurred, um, like a large rainfall event can wash in sediment into your river or lake and cause some unusual values. There can be flooding events that would cause this or um, contaminant spills. But there also can be uh, contamination or error that occurs not in your actual monitoring location, but in your process of collecting your data. So there can be contamination that occurs during your sample collection and analysis. Um, if you made a measurement error, if you weren't using your uh, field equipment properly or you hadn't properly calibrated your field equipment, that would cause an error which might um, result in outliers. And then there's also just some human um, human errors like data recording errors, data handling errors. That can also happen, which will cause errors in your data. And, um, you know, I think that it's important to note that because water bodies are so dynamic and changing, and they're influenced by so many different sources, outliers are expected. Um, so unless you've absolutely determined the source of an outlier to be human error or a data handling error, you shouldn't be removing outliers for, from your data set. Um, if you delete outliers that you, if you are deleting a bunch of outliers from your data set, what you're leaving behind is only the data which you expect to see. 
And that means you might be missing some important new information about your data. And just because something looks unusual in your data set doesn't mean it always is. It may just mean you haven't captured all the natural variability in your data set. Like as Megan was mentioning, you know, if you are only monitoring during certain months of the year, but then one year you collect a, a sample in November, which you normally don't do, you can't assess whether that data in November is natural or not. Like, you know, there you might just be missing natural variability in your data. Um, and a good way that I like to look at outliers is um, using this quote from Dennis Helsel, which states that, you know, does an outlier represent a reasonably accurate observation of an unusual situation? Um, and yeah, just keeping that in mind when you're looking at, at any errors or potential bias in your data set. And if you are interested in calculating statistics for your data set, which we're not really going to dive into too much in this webinar, but if that is something you're looking into more to quantify your data, um, this textbook from the USGS is a um, really handy resource. It's free online to download the statistical methods and water resources. Okay, so we're going to go back to the multiple box plot figure that I pulled up earlier. Um, so what you can tell from looking at this figure is that um, this is pH data collected at multiple sites in, in the Mackenzie River Basin. And you can see that at most of these sites, there are outliers. Um, so uh, this is like a great quick overview at looking at outliers in your data. but you can see that there's some that are actually quite low, some of these pH values. However, to understand a little bit more about when these outliers occurred and understand if whether or not these might be um, natural occurrences, you need to know when they occurred. So once you've used a box plot, you can also use a scatter plot. Um, this is the same data set plotted as a scatter plot or time series plot. And now this is gonna allow you to see when these outliers occurred. Um, you can see that there are a handful of these outliers that are quite low that fall below the CCME guidelines for pH for the protection of aquatic life. So um, here I'm going to ask everyone to give a little bit of input. So if you could go into the chat box, um, just make sure that when you send your message, it's to all panelists and attendees. And um, just from looking at the box plot and the time series graph, um, can anyone tell me what they observe about these outliers, if there's any information that they can observe about these outliers? I'll just give a moment here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, so we have a few comments rolling in. So they are measured at different sampling sites. They occurred during the same time, same sampling day, yes. Um, same day, yeah, could be instrument failure. Okay, all good points. So yeah, if you, if we were actually live looking at this plot on data stream, if you hovered over the data point, you would be able to tell the exact date and value of each of these data points. Um, but since this is just a screenshot, I'll just explain. Yeah, so these are all really good observations. Most of these outliers, uh, four of the six of them were collected during the same month, um, which I believe was June. And they're all measured in the same year. So all these really extreme outliers um, occurred in 2017. Um, one point here, uh, sorry, I'm not using the right screen here. One point uh, over to the left here was uh, measured in the winter. And what you notice is most of the other points were not measured in the winter. So there's not a lot to compare this one to, um, to know if that's normal for winter values. However, it is quite low. Um, and then there's also one pH value that's measured near one, which is extremely low. So in this instance, for this outlier, I would probably double check your field notes um, and just make sure that there wasn't a data handling error in that situation. But because these other points were measured um, at multiple sites, but all within the same time period, uh, it is likely that this could, it could be potentially um, a calibration error in the instrumentation. However, it could also be natural variability um, if these were measured in June, which I believe they were, that's a high flow month. Um, and high flow can bring in a lot of different sediment and material into a water body. So it's potentially uh, true natural values as well, which is why I think all of these outliers would remain in the data set. 
Okay, so here's a second exercise. We have some temperature data plotted in a box plot, as well as in a temperature uh, time series profile. And we've got one outlier value here. So what can you tell from looking at these plots about the outlier? <laughs> yeah, so uh, that outlier is extremely hot. Um, it is about 150 degrees. <laughs> above boiling. So unless you were measuring uh, temperature in a geyser in Yellowstone or out of a active hot spring, um, this is not a likely temperature value that you're going to measure in an ambient lake or river. Um, so obviously, since it's an unrealistic measurement and there's no other data points that are anywhere near that value, this must be um, some sort of human error, data handling error. And the first thing I would do for this data point is refer back to field notes, just make sure that it wasn't a transcription error and perhaps there is the, the true value measured or recorded somewhere and you can fix it. However, if it can't be resolved, this is an example of when you actually could remove an outlier from your data set. Right, so my header here, unrealistic outlier, human error. Okay, third exercise. Here is a time series plot of some ammonia data over several years. Um, you can see that in this plot, there's two different symbols. There's a circular symbol, and then there's also some upside down triangles. So what do you think is going on with this ammonia data in this plot? Yeah, so obviously the upside down triangles are indicating a different type of data. And someone noticed that this might indicate the lower limit is different at the lab. And that's, that's exactly what's happening here. So in this ammonia data set, what happened is the detection limit for ammonia was changing over time. And this is really important to note, as Megan was mentioning earlier, because if these um, observations that were measured below detection limit weren't marked or weren't pulled out as different than the rest of the data set, someone might look at this data set and interpret it as um, increasing or decreasing ammonia concentrations over time. So this step up here doesn't necessarily indicate that um, ammonia concentrations were increasing, it just means that the detection limit raised um, at this period of time. And that's all we can tell is the, we know that that is the detection limit and the ammonia value at that data point could either be below that value or not present at all. But it's important to make that distinction because if you're you know, conducting a trend analysis and you wanna see if these data are changing over time, you don't wanna be assuming that this is the true value of ammonia concentration. So this is, um, a handy way to do that. Just make sure that you have those flagged when you're identifying data below detection limits. Okay, so um, a lot of field, uh, a lot of parameters are measured in the field and they're best measured in the field because they're sensitive to other factors in the environment like um, water temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, all those parameters change based on your environment. So the most accurate representation is to take those as field observations. And often people will measure those using a probe, a YSI um, instrument, and, um, and take that back and uh, combine it with the rest of their data to analyze. However, if, if you have a bunch of field data and you wanna assess its accuracy, um, perhaps you look at some of your probe data and it just looks off. Um, it maybe looks way different than it has in other years or it's giving you values you weren't expecting. Um, something may have occurred. You either may not have calibrated your equipment properly or perhaps if you um, had a probe or YSI instrument that you deployed in a river or lake and left there to collect data over a period of time um, there could be sensor drift that occurred so it you know slowly becomes uncalibrated or perhaps the the probe got buried in sediment um, and so it would give you an incorrect value and if you wanted to double check the accuracy of your probe measurements and you had lab data that measured the same parameters. So for this example, um, this 
graph is plotting pH data from the lab versus pH data from the field. If your field data is generally, is if it's accurate, there should be a general one-to-one -one relationship between that parameter in the field and in the lab. It may not be exact, but this should be like, a, like this scatter plot shows here, it should be about a general one-to-one. -one. And if it's not, that'll indicate that there might be some sensor drift or something occurring in your field data. Okay, so um, another point that can get a bit complicated, but we're just going to try to lay it out pretty simply here, is that when you are looking at data um, and you want to compare data between, say, two different data sets, you have your data set and you have another data set, and you both measured um, a certain parameter, like a nutrient, like nitrate, and you want to compare them between each other. It's not just the parameter or characteristic name that's important when you're looking at a data set. Um, it's also important to note sample fraction and method speciation when you're describing a parameter. So sample fraction is the portion of a characteristic being analyzed, and then method speciation is the chemical speciation being measured. And as I noted, that's extremely important, especially for nutrient data, because that um, can be measured several different ways. So if a characteristic has a different sample fraction, um, such as total or dissolved, that means filtered or unfiltered, it's actually measuring some, uh, different things and they can't be cross compared. Um, and if there's different multiple um, method speciations, such as um, ammonia data could be measured as nitrogen ion or as an ammonium uh, ammonium molecule, that's going to give you different concentration values and they can't be compared one to one. And since this is quite um, a in-depth topic, DataStream's actually published a nutrient guidance document that you can use uh, if you're about to upload your data to DataStream or you want to properly describe your and clarify your different parameters um, when you've collected nutrient data. I would refer to that guide. It's on the datastream.org webpage under resources, and that will help um, define your sample fraction and method speciation properly. And here's a schematic from DataStream's um, Science Explainer uh, Water Quality Monitoring Guide. And this just helps visualize the difference between total and dissolved sample fractions. So a total fraction of a water sample is the entire unfiltered water sample. So it's including the dissolved portion of um, of a certain parameter, as well as the total or particulate portion of the um, undissolved portion of the water sample. And then once you've filtered that sample, that is when you are measuring the dissolved fraction. And then whether if you have um, filtered a water sample, you can also collect the residue that's left on the filter. So the non-filterable portion, you can also analyze that if you're looking, if you're interested in knowing um, the undissolved or suspended solid fraction within a water sample. And um, total versus dissolved fractions can also be used as a tool for QCing your data. Um, if you have a data set, say you have metals measured in your data set like copper, and you notice that your total copper values for one year look particularly low compared to another, other years or dissolved looks particularly high, um, and you have dissolved and total fractions measured at the lab, you can plot total versus dissolved against each other just to check to make sure nothing strange is going on. So in this plot here, we see that all of the dissolved copper concentrations are generally higher than the total, which doesn't make sense because dissolved is part of total, it cannot be higher than total. So this is obviously um, some sort of data handling error that occurred here. Um, names might have been mixed up something might have happened. So you'd want to go back to your data set and figure out what's happening there. And this is um, a plot just to illustrate the importance of method speciation prior to comparing data sets. So this is nitrate concentration data over time. Um, if you haven't um, properly um, accounted for the method speciation, uh, it's going to give you completely different concentration values. So this is the same nitrate measure uh, data measured as nitrogen or measured as the nitrate compound. And you can say, even though this is the exact same data set, if you are measuring it as different species, it's going to give you totally different concentrations. And those aren't comparable as they are. You would need to convert from one method species or make sure they're all in one method speciation before comparing. <clears throat> And finally, I will just highlight the importance of data tables as well, since we've been spending quite a bit of time on graphs. Um, 
So data tables are a great way to summarize data sets and make some calculations. So if you're looking at some of your quality control data, say you've collected duplicate or replicate data, and you want to analyze what the difference is between some of your duplicates or replicates, you can summarize it in a data table. This is an example of duplicate data pulled from data stream. So when you're looking at duplicates, what you want to first ask yourself is how different are the duplicates? Um, you can calculate the difference between um, duplicates for each sample. Um, if there is a large difference between your duplicates, you want to know what type of duplicate it is, whether it was collected in the field or split in the lab, because that'll tell you a little bit more about why there might be um, that large amount of variability. And you also want to hand, uh, rule out data handling error when you're looking at your replicates. So you just want to make sure that if there is a really large um, difference in some of your duplicate data, that it's not a mislabeled sample. Um, perhaps that replicate was actually a blank, or perhaps that replicate got assigned to the wrong sample, um, which is giving you a really large discrepancy. So you want to be really careful about that when you're analyzing. And a lot of um, in consulting and from lab reports, um, a lot of people will use this, this calculation relative percent difference. So this is just giving you the, the difference between two duplicate values. And I won't dive into the formula, I'll just I'll leave it here for reference. Um, but essentially, when you calculate this relative percent difference, it's indicating how reproducible or um, uh, the precision between your, your duplicate samples. So um, a high RPD means that there's low reproducibility. And this isn't necessarily meaningful unless you know what type of variability you're expecting in your duplicate samples. So it's important to define that first before you analyze whether your relative percent difference is good or bad in your samples. Uh, and then we also um, showed an example of what you can do and how you can summarize some blank data in your data set. So this is what blank data would look like if you pulled it from data stream. Um, first, you can summarize it in a data table and you can count how many of your blank samples um, were hits or how many were measured above the detection limit or the measurement limit. And then if you do not notice that there's some above measurement limit, you wanna look at what type of blank it is. Um, and that'll indicate the potential source of contamination that caused that um, that hit. And then you also, um, as with replicate data, the same with blanks, you want to rule out data handling errors as well. You want to make sure that your blank wasn't actually mislabeled, like perhaps that your blank is actually a duplicate or what was labeled as a blank is actually just a true grab sample. Um, make sure that that's not the case as well before you start analyzing your data. Okay, so this is the, the last slide. And so just to summarize everything that we've covered, ultimately um, the errors and bias that you discovered during your quality control process will end up informing your next year's monitoring program. So, you know, what quality assurance measures you're gonna take next year, it'll help improve the results of your study. So, and that will be informed by um, any con quality control results that you came up with. So. You'll learn through quality control how to better account for errors in your data, whether that's updating your sampling protocols or collecting more replicates and blanks next year to help quantify your variability or quantify any potential contamination. Um, so it is really just a cyclical um, process that we will improve year to year as you refine the monitoring program. Okay, so this is the last Dive Into Data webinar for 2020. Um, so just stay tuned for any program updates in our 2021 webinar schedule as well. Um, you can follow DataStream on social media. You can send us an email at datastream at gordonfn.org or you can sign up for our newsletter um, using this link or through the datastream.org webpage. And um, at this point, we're happy to answer any questions that have come up through the webinar um, and if, people have run out of time and need to get going, we can also um, answer questions via email later on. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Oh.